Say uh, thanks for coming out here uh, tonight to our uh, Coastal Community Resiliency Session uh, on tourism. I know last time I kind of compared the series of CCR events here to a, a, a movable Italian feast. So once again, here we are. We find ourselves uh, at dessert, and I wonder how well traveled uh, our audience here is. Uh, just shout out how many Italian desserts can you think of just off the top of your head? Here? Uh, tiramisu. Okay, that's a good one. Good one. Yeah. Any others? Give me two more. Yeah. Cannoli. That's one. <laughs> Tiramisu again, okay. Limoncello. limoncello. Okay, that's yeah. You take a shot of limoncello. We'll save the limoncello for the program wrap up. All right, when, when everything's got a nice bow. Have a order of pizza. All right, so here we are. Uh, we find ourselves at the uh, tourism CCR. Thanks for braving the uh, liquid sunshine uh, on your way in. Uh, you know, tourism is a vital component to the economy here uh, in New Smyrna Beach. Over 20% of our jobs come directly from hospitality. Uh, in restaurants, and 19% uh, comes from retail trade. That's almost half of uh, our economy being directly sourced uh, from the, the tourists that visit us here from out of town. So, uh, before we go any further, I'd like to kick things off by acknowledging our uh, city staff members here. Board of Tenants, if uh, please go ahead and uh, stand. You can be acknowledged. Yep, they're okay. And I'd also like to acknowledge our uh, elected officials right there. I see uh, Commissioner Hartman in the back. And then I saw Commissioner Sachs as well. Where's he? Where's he yep, there we go. All right. Yeah, well, welcome one, welcome all. Uh, so uh, we, we've got a lot of heavy hitters here around the port. We've got presidents, CEOs, we've got directors, executives. So uh, my hats off. Special thanks here and a round of applause for Debbie Beals for uh, putting this all together. She's our executive director here at the Logistics uh, Bureau. So she'll be taking things from here. All right, so just a little administrative housekeeping. Uh, at your tables, you should have uh, some blank note cards. Uh, so this is going to be an interactive session here, right? Uh, you can just go ahead and nod your head and then leave. But what we want is your input, and I guarantee you that the input you get here is going to be looked at by our staff members, our neighborhood council members, and our city departments, our city manager, and it's going to go all the way up to the city commission. So what you tell us tonight is going to have a material effect on the future of this city. All right, don't forget that. So as the speakers are uh, giving their presentations, uh, I'll be going around the room collecting your question cards, uh, as well as uh, Nancy Maddox. Right here, she's our director of leisure services here for the city, uh, and then we'll wrap it up with a Q&A session uh, at the end. There. So be sure to stick around till the very end to get your questions answered. And uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand the mic over to uh, Nancy Maddox. Good evening, everyone. Um, we just want to Um, and then all of the input for those who were here um, that you, you gave was that evening. So 
these are the questions that we asked and, and the results. So which three of the youth programs, activities listed below are most important to members of, of your household? Um, number one is summer programs, number two is after school, and number three is art classes. Good thing we have a lot of art in, in East Mona Beach. Um, question number two, which three of, of the programs, activities listed below are most important to the adult members of your household? Number one was personal fitness instruction. Number two, educational lectures. And number three was art classes. And this is all going to be online, so if you want to go back and look at it later, you're more than welcome to. The next one, would you be willing to pay for a youth program? A resounding 7% said yes. Number four, which three reasons prevent you or other members of your household from using the recreational programs offered by the city of East Myrna Beach? Obviously, we have some homework to do on our marketing because we're not getting the word out to all of you very well. Um, so that is the largest hate bond, that we didn't know what we offered and what was available. What athletic sport camps do you want at the sports complex? Where they gave a wide variety, but um, walking, run, yoga, aerobics, um, there's surfing in there, there's shuffleboard, there's everything. So we're going to take a closer look at that and try to get a little more drilled down on that one. Currently, the city runs lacrosse, flag football, and various camps. The remaining sports are run by different sport affiliates. Would you want more sports to be run by the city? And 52% said yes. And they asked, what kind of sports would you like? Um, and again, all different types. There was swimming, tennis, and wrestling. And of course, pickleball was the number one. Because <laughs> the pickleball people sing in court. <laughs> <laughs> would you like the city to install field turf at the sports complex to allow multiple sports to play on the field? Um, 38% said yes, and 62% said no. How important do you think it is for the city of East Mona Beach to have another community slash recreation center? So if you pick very important, somewhat important, and important, it way outweighs the not important almost two to one. Are you aware of the scholarship program for youth summer camp experts and for participants? Again, we need to get the word out better. No, 72%. Would you be willing to, to a bond issue or designate a tax for additional recreation facility? Um, it's about equal, yes and no. Um, but the response was that they needed to be more specific before they voted on anything to really understand what it was going for. Last, what else would you like to have available from the city to service as programs? And again, art classes, arts and craft shows, beach trail cycling, more use of brand center, communication, social media, big brothers program. So there's all kinds of different things. Walking programs, uh, beach water programs, and then first aid programs. So we had a lot of that. And that was our, our survey. So with that, I'm going to turn it now over to Debbie Mills. And thank you. coming out tonight. My name is Debbie Mills and I'm the Executive Director of the East Mona Beach Visitors Bureau. And I'd like to just take a moment to thank the City of East Mona Beach. I know the City Manager Pam Brancaccio is here, her staff Nancy, Philip, everybody else that I may have missed. You guys are wonderful to work with. Thank you so much for all of your support. Um, I also want to introduce our Southeast Volusia Advertising Authority Board members that are here tonight. We have Donna Ruby, she's our treasurer of Southeast Volusia. Mike Arman, please stand up. Mike Arman, he's our vice chair. Chad Tussle on the game here tonight from Marine Discovery Center is also our board member. And I want
want to take a moment to introduce staff. Would staff stand up in the room? Um, they were so helpful in everything we do, and we couldn't do it without them, so thank you for all your closing efforts. And last but not least, all of the great tourism partners that you saw over on the other side, that's only a small fraction that make up the tourism industry here in East Myrtle Beach. So thank you very much for coming out tonight and mixing and mingling with everybody. It's so important. So um, I'm going to get started, and I'm going to introduce the panel here, and then one by one we'll go down the road, and um, we're going to shed some great information on tourism and things we're doing in the future here. I think you're really going to like what we have to say tonight and how you can get involved with us. Um, also on the panel here tonight is Dave Randall. Dave, Dave, just put your hand up there. He's from the Whale Center, also um, the Blue Community. You'll hear about all our sustainability efforts coming up shortly. Roberta Schatz. Shirtail Brands, our advertising agency. Joe Tinkersley from the Unique Visions. Um, he is uh, a Disney Imagineer and he's going to tell quite a compelling story about how we can envision our future cities and how we can all work together. And of course, Chad Fussell from Marine Discovery Center and all the great amazing things they do for the IRL. Okay, so a little bit about us. Uh, we are Southeast Volusia Advertising Authority. And we are charged with marketing this area as a premier destination. So we reach out to our actual and our potential visitors, and we want them to come to New Smyrna Beach to vacation and make memories. That's our mission. Our vision is to research exactly who is our visitor and to reach out to them. We make a brand promise by, by authentically marketing this destination. And we want to protect our products here by doing it in a very sustainable way. So sustainable tourism, you're going to hear a lot tonight, very, very important to us. I'm not sure if many of you know, but we are state statute to collect the bed tax. In 1987, Volusia County signed a charter, and uh, we are under statute number 212, uh, sections 3 and 4, and we collect, a, uh, we collect pennies on the tourism tax that visitors pay when they check into the lodging boutiques. And that is our um, coffers that we do our marketing with and um, look forward to putting that back into the industry to re replenish. Uh, I introduced three of our board members out of the seven that are here. The Volusia County Council appoints our board members. And we're charged with making a marketing plan and implementing the budget with the tourism tax dollars. Um, so we are doing business as New Smyrna Beach Visitor Bureau, but we are proper name is Southeast Volusia Advertising Authority. So just a little bit about the pennies and how they're spent. Uh, we collect six cents on every dollar that the visitor spends at a lodging property in Southeast Volusia, which is five communities. It's Port Orange, New Smyrna Beach, Edgewater, Oak Hill, and Osteen. Uh, approximately 3% of that goes to the Ocean Center and then 2% goes back to marketing for Southeast Volusia. And there's a small administration fee that the county takes for collecting and doing all the reconciliation with all that. Just to kind of show you what we've been up to in the past year, we've had about six years of steady tourism growth. On average, about 5% we can see the tourism tax collections um, through the years. Um, we're on par this year to have another um, year of sustained growth. And a little bit about where we market. Um, I've heard a lot of things about us just marketing in Orlando. They may have done that in the past, but we reach out to our top feeder markets, which are New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Boston, Chicago, predominantly east of the Mississippi. So I think that's really important. And we do have six thrive markets in the state of Florida. And that is very important because as we know, the economy goes ups and has ups and downs, and there's troughs. It's really important to maintain your drive market as well as the fly market. Uh, we know that Daytona Beach International Airport is growing. They just signed a contract with Sunwing, a Canadian charter um, and scheduled aircraft that will be coming in at the end of January. So that's one of our top feeder markets in the international market. Um, we also market in the United Kingdom and in Central Europe, which is Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. So we, it's very important to stay in the international market because that traveler will come, they'll stay longer, they'll spend more money, they're very athletic, they're very fit, they love to walk. Everything we do, the messaging is to be, to leave only your footprints, to try to be as sustainable as you can. Come stay in the hotels, 
you know, purchase products here, you know, give back, do some volunteerism. So there's a lot of neat things that we're going to be doing with a lot of our visitors and residents alike. Okay. So some of the pieces that we use in our tours and marketing campaigns, we have our website. If you visit nscfl.com, you can see a little screenshot there. If you haven't been there, please check it out. We have a lot of great information, events. We also have a mobile app. It's available for free on the iTunes Store or the Google Play. You can download that. We have a visitor guide, which is at your tables. Um, that we produce every two years. We're actually um, working with the Time Inc. publisher right now to publish our next version of the guide. And actually, Travel and Leisure Magazine is doing an um, editorial um, stories on it. And also, they were just in Destination doing a photo shoot in August. Uh, what we're trying to do is raise the bar. Travel and Leisure Magazine has a very upscale traveler, a very uh, connoisseur when it comes to the travel market. So the demographics are very high. We know they'll come here, maybe they'll come back and open a business. Um, great memories, they, they are very athletic, you know, fit. They do all those things that we love our visitors to partake in. Um, the next thing we have is an area guide map. And you'll see those at your tables too. Um, a lot of times the visitors come in the Welcome Center and they want to know exactly where to go, things to do, what to rent. Um, so we are in a team that we met previously and help out with all the visitors and all of their things to do. Now you heard me talk about sustainable tourism. You're going to hear Dave and Joe and Chad and everybody talk about it as well. Um, the Blue Community um, One Penny at Living um, is an amazing organization. And they started in the UK. They built about 12 totally um, sustainable complexes, housing developments. Um, it's, it's a really amazing organization. If you get a chance, go to onepennyatliving.com. Well, we are so fortunate that we're able to work with them. And I think Ben Gill is going to be coming over in December. We've got a certification program that we're working on with our hotels, our restaurants, our attractions. And I must admit, this industry is amazing. We already have about 21 restaurants that are eliminating single-use plastics. That means the takeout bag, they're not auto-strawing, they call it, where they just automatically, the waitress gives you a straw. They're asking, they have signs on the table that please, if you don't mind, do you really need this straw? Um, the straw? Shadow probably tell you there's a lot of necropsy that's been done on the mammals in the Atlantic, in the Indian River Lagoon, that they have the little tiny plastic beads because the water breaks down the plastics. And then the fish and the turtles and everybody's uh, ingesting that and it's very toxic. So um, we've made strides. Um, Third Wave um, is here. They're in our um, certification program. And as a restaurant, they've done some amazing things. So I really um, hope that you'll reach out to the local restaurants and when you can, bring your sustainable cup and refill it and um, do away with the straw. And you can help. Um, a lot of the restaurants are using paper wrap for their to-go orders or that they have used straw, uh, uh, forks or spoons. So we're so excited with everything they're doing. So tourism by the numbers is, is a large industry and we have the ability to, to potentially bring in a lot of people. And we're not mass marketing by any means, but whatever we do market, we want to make sure that we have a sustainable message in there. We want to make sure that we're getting into the visitor's mind and the resident and staff that we need to protect the product that we have. We are so blessed that we live in this beautiful coastal chic area and we want to keep it that way. So just know that we are being a good steward and we want to have everyone join us on that. So we're going to be offering a certification program to hotels, restaurants, and attractions. We're going to be messaging to our, our, excuse me, our, our visitors to embrace sustainable practices, join us on this cause, do some volunteerism with us. And we also are going to start giving out tours and championship awards. So those people that go that extra mile and help us in all these efforts, we're going to reward you. We're going to um, give you some accreditation on that. And our first training starts in December. So um, our industry will start hearing more about that as well. So I am going to go ahead and turn this over to Roberta Shops from our agency, um, Turkel Brands. He's going to talk to you about some of the um, public statements that we have and, and the initiatives we're going to do, and also about our economic impact numbers. Uh, you have a card at your table which has some of that, and he's going to show you even more. Thank you, Vicki. Um, 
So usually when you hear advertising, you hear, well, what's that guy going to show a pretty picture? But I'm actually pretty, I'm very pleased today that I'm actually going to show you numbers. What I mean by that is I'm going to show you the impact, what it means for us to uh, market this, des this beautiful destination uh, as a tourism destination. Uh, and every time I have an opportunity to come here, and by the way, I'm one of those visitors, uh, I get to enjoy it, but I always feel bad that these presentations are done this way. You know, truly, you guys should be looking that way. But, uh, you know, one of these days we'll, we'll, we'll fix that. Um, you know, tourism brings uh, a lot to, a lot more than just guests uh, to the destination. Last year we almost uh, brought, you know, 360,000 uh, visitors to the community. Uh, and that has an economic impact. Uh, and the reason it has an economic impact is because it goes across more than what we know to be, you know, tourism, the hotel stay. It, it truly is more than that. As uh, Debbie was mentioning, you know, 21 restaurants are already participating in this program. Uh, I usually come up to New Smyrna on Tuesdays, uh, and unfortunately, that's when the third wave is closed, and I get bummed because I enjoy so much going to have dinner there. Uh, but Guess what? I'm coming back on Saturday uh, for the Jazz Festival, and so I'm going to get to enjoy not only them but many more. Which means that I'll get to uh, enjoy myself at the at the bars, at the coffee shops. Can't wait to go to the Island Road Surfs, uh, do some shopping, uh, you know, rent some bikes or rent uh, kayaks to enjoy the the, the lagoon, uh, do some fishing, and eventually, well, I'll get some passes and tickets to go to the Jazz Festival. So the economic impact is is huge, and it's and it's spread out. Um, I happened to be here at one of these meetings at the beginning when, it, when we were talking about uh, uh, growth and development, and it was very interesting to see many of you participating talk about we want to have in this community, you know, great restaurants and great stores and good shopping and, you know, good, all of these things. Well, it is this economic impact that assists us and helps us in bringing all those things. So what have we done? Well, one of the things we've done is visitors have paid almost 15 uh, billion dollars in state and local taxes. Those are, those are taxes that you, I guess, because I'm, I don't live here, but you didn't have to pay. Uh, one statistic says that about 40% of uh, sales tax in this in this county is paid by the visitors. So uh, you know that you, we all get a break. That money goes to be invested in many areas of our community, uh, including you know environmental programs, infrastructure, safety. Uh, you know, schools, arts and culture, uh, which comes directly driven from, from that. Uh, the pictures being, our numbers tell us that we, well, you as residents, are saving about $330 a year in taxes because of those visitors that are coming here today. Um, as we were talking earlier, you know, it's, uh, uh, Nancy was talking about the visitors, or sorry, Philip was talking about the jobs that are created our, our numbers tell us that about every 72 visitors generates one, one, uh, one job in the industry. Uh, today we have about 5,000 uh, uh, tourism jobs uh, created in this community. So at the end of the day, tourism really impacts us, uh, us so much so that we believe and we have, you know, you knew that as an advertising guy, I was not gonna say without showing you pictures. So here's my chance. Um, you know, tourism, tourism uh, as we see it, you know, touches you, touches all of us here in this room and in, in this community, and it helps us uh, uh, maintain all the things that we love about this community, uh, including the, the, the lagoon. Um, this is one of our uh, uh, ads to try to promote and try to, try to communicate to everyone uh, the importance and the value of tourism in this community. Uh, you know, it, it protects the things that you love. Interesting enough, uh, in a minute, uh, Chad's going to be talking about that program and you'll get to understand what that is. But if it wasn't for the support of the visitors that visit um, the, uh, the Marine Discovery Center and everything that's being done uh, through, through the programs, as, as uh, Debbie was uh, mentioning before, uh, we won't be able to do this. And so it is, it is this support and it's this economy that drives it. And one of the things we want to see, too, is we want all of us to have one of these in the back of our uh, uh, of our truck, uh, in our car, uh, or in some ways to be able to communicate to everybody that you know tourism protects the things that you love, uh, and it's obviously very intentional that we're showing this, you know, through the design of a turtle. Uh, with that, I'll actually leave you with uh, two.
have to tell you exactly how he and his team do the wonderful things that they do across the Middle East. All right, uh, happy to be here and um, just share a little bit about what we do at the Marine Discovery Center. So if you think about um, tourism and how it relates to a nonprofit nature center, you know, you, you might not understand the connection, right? So obviously we are a destination. Uh, we're, we're, we're working to uh, provide um, an opportunity for the tourists to visit our center. But we have an obligation as a tourist attraction to make sure that that tourist is gonna to leave this town with a better understanding of how unique, how special this body of water is. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about some of the programs that help us uh, make that connection to the tourists. It's that when they walk away, it's not only that, wow, this is a great foodie town, this is a great art town, and this is a you know, beautiful ocean and a great, and a great surf, but wow, that in environment, the diversity of wildlife that I saw in a very small area on a two-hour eco-tour on the boat or a kayak or just a stroll on, in Serena James Park is pretty special. And for those of you I'm born and raised in Florida, whether you are or not, it never gets old in this, you know, in this water. It's always something that will, you know, that will that will unveil itself if you if you keep your eyes and your, and your ears and your nose and all your senses open, you'll learn a lot. So that's what our, our goal is, is to, to teach people that. So that's our mission, um, to protect and restore Florida's coastal and unique river lagoon ecosystems through education, research, and community stewardship. And our biggest thing that we do is education, like I talked about. How do we educate both the little, you know, the, the little, what we call our sea squirts, they're the ones, uh, which is, by the way, in biology, it's a tunicate. Uh, it's, it's an actual critter that's out there. Um, but, but also to the adult, right? So we teach the very young to, you know, retirees and people who uh, just have retired and always want to learn more about their backyard because they lived here their whole life, but they just moved here. And they're like, you know what? Now it's my turn to kind of, this is a career I've always kind of been fascinated by, so we want to learn more about it. Um, so these are some of the different things that we do, field trips, um, different types of camp programs, archery, vivid tours, monthly uh, public lectures. This Thursday, we have a public lecture on lionfish. Many of you know lionfish are beautiful, but they're very invasive. They completely gobble up all of our uh, juvenile fisheries out in the ocean. And unfortunately, you cannot fish for them uh, via hook and line. So you actually have to go down and dive and spear them, which makes them a, a challenge in order to control Right? But here's the great thing, they're delicious. So, um, so we can create a commodity right, out, of this, out of this resource that we want to remove. And so we're actually going to have some local chefs providing some uh, tasting of lionfish on Thursday night. You guys can come check it out, it's free of charge. It's a way for us to, because we know food is a great way to entice people. Right? It's a great way to connect people to the resource. And then also now get that education in of how we can you know, what, what can we do to help remove these uh, from being such a, a catastrophe in our oceans? And then, uh, of course, other things that we do, Florida Mass Naturalist Program, uh, that's a group of adults right out here, South Conway, just right back that way, as Roberto said. Um, you do have the unfortunate perspective. Mine's much better, but uh, um, that's where we were. We're out there with, with our, you know, our group, 15, 20, 25 people, uh, just talking about the lagoon, the different, uh, Benthic animals, the bottom dwelling animals, the water quality, uh, the diversity, um, six days of coursework, and a 40 hour uh, total program. So that's someone, we have people that travel all over the state of Florida, and even sometimes out of the state, to come here to New Sword Beach to take that course. Um, so it's really kind of become a unique course for us to offer, and a great way for someone who comes here to New Sword Beach for the first time to come away with 40 hours of hands on. University of Florida accredited programming about Florida's coastal ecosystems and how unique and special they are, and then take that back to their respective area and, and say, you know, 
this place has got it right. They're doing some really good things. Um, there's a lot more we can do, but we're doing some good things. So the other big thing that we really uh, pride ourselves in is coastal restoration. Roberto talked about the Shuck and Share program, which I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. But um, this is what we call our community, or excuse me, our conservation science work. So a, a big part of our um, work at the Marine Discovery Center is to get the community involved in learning about the resource but not just learning about it, actually contributing to the data set. Because if we create a long-term data set, we can see trends. So for example, uh, some of you uh, I know have been with us in the past where we go out in the lagoon late at night, sometimes 2 o'clock in the morning, from Canaveral National Seashore up to Spruce Creek, searching for horseshoe crabs uh, spawning in April, May. And the reason that we're doing that is because when we talk to you all, and some of you all have told us these stories, 20 years ago, you, you know, 30 years ago, I remember when, right? We always hear that story, I remember when. There was horseshoe crabs everywhere. Well, nobody really had any baseline information, no real data, so we can't really quantify that. So what we're trying to establish is an actual baseline of information of how many horseshoe crabs are actually out there. I mean, how many of you know that horseshoe crabs are extremely uh, valuable for you and I? They provide an endotoxin test. It's one of the most widely used. Their blood is used for an endotoxin test to make sure that every vaccination that goes into your body is sterile. And so we can tell, we can make sure that these fever-causing bacteria are not in that vaccination by using the blood of a horseshoe crab. That's pretty cool. These animals are right here. They live 20, 25 years. They're prehistoric living fossils. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we want the visitor to take away. Now sure, not everyone's going to get as geeked out as I am about horseshoe crabs, I get it. But I'm telling you, we've seen the transition occur when people come, and, they, and we really are about repeat, we call them repeat offenders, come out more than once, and, and that aha moment will happen, and then all of a sudden they're touching, they're feeling, their senses are completely heightened, they get it, and they walk away, understanding more about the destination and how unique it is. So um, we're also really excited uh, when it comes to the idea of the cultural heritage. Um, if you don't know, the Marine Discovery Center is located at the old New Smyrna Beach High School. Um, a lot of history on that site. Um, it used to be a, a, a salt marsh and mangrove forest. And then it was filled in. And actually, the Washingtonian palms on Chicken Island that you guys see right over here was a result of some of the restoration. I think I'm getting that right, Steve. Some of the mitigation, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I know you would know. But, but, but so when that happened, when we filled that site years ago, where, we, where the old high school was, um, we had to do, we, the, the property had to go to the state, and it had to be always used for education. So after the high school was done, that's when the FWC, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, went ahead and took it over. So, our role on that property is to educate uh, the community about the coastal ecosystems, but also a big part of this restoration. So we took five acres of the site, we restored it back into its original salt marsh and mangrove habitat, and now because we realized that the high school was also a big part of this community, and although it moves, I, we see people probably daily, they come and do the, the drive-by, and you, see, and you can tell that they used to be a student 20, 30 years ago, and they're just looking all around, like, wow. You know, and, and I'll, if I'm outside, and I'll answer questions, but um, one of the things was that we had an auditorium on the property, and when it could not be refurbished, the economy uh, hit the wall, we really want to do something as a way to honor that community presence beyond just what Marine Discovery Center does. So that's why our next project is all about an amphitheater trail systems, major landscaping. It'll be done in about a month and a half. So we're looking forward to sharing that you know, with you guys. We want to do screenings of different movies that, um, you know, that, that, that tell the story of the Indian River Lagoon, um, but also that tell the story of how we can utilize art, food, create community through these outdoor venues um, at a nature center. So we're excited about that. So Shuck and Share, um, you know, one of the things that we looked at when we looked at our sustainable practices is it's hard for us to preach it, you know, if or teach it when we're, you know, 
when we're really not internally maybe doing some of these things. So one of the first things we did to make sure, probably five or six years ago, maybe longer, my staff was like, you can't do that. All of our guests have to have bottled water. They'll figure it out. We're gonna, we're gonna get rid of all bottled water and we're gonna make sure that we communicate correctly, tell them to bring their own. Obviously we have emergency water just in case. We got a water bottle filling station, but that's a simple way that if we're gonna practice what we preach, we have to have internal ways of reducing our impact to make sure that, that when we practice our programming and so forth, that we're not having a long lasting uh, negative impact, but more like a long lasting positive impact. So we try to reduce plastics. One is by not giving out water bottles, simple, right? It's not a huge dent, but it's something. Other things that we looked at is our gift shop. What things are we selling in our gift shop that potentially might just be a one and done? Right, so we had, so we looked at that. We're still looking at that. We're still not there, um, but we also now offer some different things on in the gift shop, like reusable straws. Um, I know for some of you that sounds kind of weird, but you know there are reusable straws out there. They're metal or bamboo, um, and other types of products, water bottles, things like that that we're offering. Um, so single-use plastics is definitely an issue that we, and I think all of us understand right? as. Debbie was talking about International Coastal Cleanup. Anyone here participate past Saturday? Great event, thank you for all that came out. Uh, it's, the biggest, it's the biggest effort in the world to cleaning up our beaches third Saturday of every September. So we, we were at a couple locations, but this is a bucket of trash you know, that was picked up. Um, glasses and spoons and water bottles and straws. It's still full of sand, so I won't take it all out. But my, my flip-flops, of course, with some great barnacles and a nice little shovel. Sorry, Nancy. <laughs> but but the, the point is, is that um, plastic is a polymer. It doesn't go away. It, um, we, plastic in general is, is vital to a lot of the things in our lives. But a single-use plastic, unfortunately, is just that. It's used once, very often if we rethink it, we probably didn't have to use it 20 or 30 years ago, and now where does it go? Unfortunately, it doesn't get recycled. It doesn't break down by nature. It's only photodegradable, so light can break down only to smaller parts, but then those smaller parts persist for 100, 200 plus years. And that's the problem, is our world's oceans are full of plastic. Now, you might see that some plastics are now being called biodegradable, or a bioplastic. Unfortunately, they are, the, the, or, the origin of the product is still uh, a natural substance, which is good. It's, it might be corn or it might be soy or something like that. So the origin is better than, than petroleum. However, it's still chemically a polymer that cannot break down through natural bacteria or, or, or uh, fungus breaking it down. So it still persists as a plastic. There's some new technology out there, these PHA polymers. We hope that some of that will be you know, a good thing. But in general, we need to just look at how do we reduce. So for example, Marine Discovery Center is challenged right now. Um, and it's a good challenge. And we're looking at all the partners uh, that we're working with. But our Chuck and Share program, which if you look at these numbers, just in 2017, we recycled 118,000, uh, almost 119,000 pounds of oyster shells from going into the waste stream. And so because our, our shoreline restoration coordinator, she's rolling her eyes, is here, I want to acknowledge her really quick for all of her efforts for that program. She leads the effort. Jesse Wells did a great job in that program. And also, uh, all of the restaurants that contributed, we have over 10 restaurants, depending on the time of year. Waste Pro is such a great partner. But we use a type of plastic, it's an aquaculture grade plastic that we put into the system. And some people are like, well, how do you preach plastic, but you use plastic in order to get this accomplished? So let me tell you where we are, because we struggle with it. We use it because it is an, it, this is an engineered way of how do we restore oysters. We've used everything else from looking at burlap bags to uh, you know, uh, logs and shell just by themselves without even being put in the plastic. And all of our partners, by the way, when I say we, I mean all of the partners. Um, they're the ones who are primarily doing the restoration. We help provide the materials. There is nothing right now that works in our system except for these types of products. 
We are looking at other products. There's a new product that's out, that's out there. It's kind of promising called Beads. Um, it is out of uh, is it Switzerland? Netherlands. Netherlands, thank you. And, uh, and it is a bioplastic that shows some promise in cedar tea, but on the East Coast, it still has yet to encourage the recruitment of oysters. So my point in this kind of long-winded story here is that we are also struggling internally of like how do we make sure that a single-use plastic uh, we reduce. Um, and although I think uh, when it comes to oysters, I wouldn't necessarily call the way that we use a single-use plastic, but we understand the optics. It's challenging, right? But with that being said, we're getting great recruitment. It's almost like if you put a vinyl, if you create a vinyl PVC seawall and you get oysters on it. That's kind of what we're doing. We're creating a habitat with oysters and building up the capacity. Our role is to create, um, if you think about the impact that we've had over years and years on this system, we keep stressing it, but we're not helping the system create a, uh, its own, better its immune system. So our role is to help increase the immune system. We just help get it started, and then hopefully the, the system itself will go, will get better. Anyways, uh, it's a great program, Shuck and Share, and, uh, I hope you guys um, are, are can help get involved with that. And then here's the, the idea of, of what else we can do in plastic. I know I'm kind of going in a circle. I feel like I started strong and then I kind of dove down here. But um, the idea, guys, is, is um, there's a lot that we can do uh, as a destination to make sure that our visitor walks away understanding the diversity of the Indian River Lagoon, the challenges that we face, stormwater, the septic, with sewer, with fertilizer, and that each person, whether you're a visitor or you're a resident, do understand that we have a role to play in making our community better. And if we all work together, we absolutely can. Um, I really do vision one day when we celebrate that New Smyrna Beach is not just a destination for its beaches, but for how the people treat and care for its backyard in the River Lagoon. We're not there yet, but this is a pretty special waterway. A couple of our impacts uh, for 2017, 456 volunteers um, came, came through and helped us out. We had about 10,000 guests on our boat tours, 118,000 oyster shells recycled, about 4,600 kids came through our camps and field trip programs. And we had around 4,000 uh, people impacted by our lectures and so forth. So just going to give you an idea on our, on our annual numbers. And I think from here, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dave Randall. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. You give new meaning to the term doing your bucket list. So. <laughs> so, yeah, So I want to talk a little bit about coastal resiliency tonight. And that is really critical because we want to maintain and sustain the beautiful things we have in our tourism community. We have to be a little more resilient. Uh, Debbie's mentioned the Blue Community um, Program. We're actually part of the UN World Tourism Organization, where we're the first designated observatory in the United States, uh, actually North America. And uh, we have become a leader in helping set examples and best practices thanks to people like Debbie and Chad and others um, around the state. But sustainable tourism, as it's moving today, goes back to the work of the International Strategies for Disaster Reduction. I had an opportunity to spend a week with them in Geneva. And the one takeaway that I came from them when they said, when you have a disaster or crisis, it doesn't matter if you're trying to prevent it, you're trying to mitigate it while it's happening, or you're trying to recover, the solution is the same, more sustainability. And so much so that is now the, the foundation and the driver for what are now the UN Sustainable Development Goals. <coughs> In our blue community model, We've taken the accepted standards of the Global Sustainable Tourism Council, their four pillars of economics and 
social and environment and management. And we coupled that with strategies that we co-developed with the Walt Disney Company, our blue community strategies, to create some safe structures and more sustainable ways of doing things. But we do that within the limits of what are called the science of planetary boundaries. I know that's a complex term for many of you, but think of climate change as one of nine boundaries. Science is a little nervous that we're so focused on climate change, we're overlooking eight other ways we can destroy ourselves. I'm not gonna go into all nine of those, but I can say you know, a couple, depletion of fresh water resources. We all know what happens when we don't have fresh water. We know what, ha what happens when we have ocean acidification. We know what happens when we don't have any forests and so forth. These are all other indicators for planetary boundaries. And the One Planet uh, Living Framework, which Debbie mentioned, uh, headquartered in the UK, we have now partnered with them to put our strategies with their framework together. And New Smyrna Beach has been chosen as one of two cities in the state of Florida to pilot a new program for that integration, which will be starting the end of November. So congratulations to all of you for being back achievements. And these uh, 10 areas are, are really um, the nucleus of what's being used worldwide to implement sustainability. And the concept is really pretty simple. When they built uh, this resort that I've been working with in France called Villages Nature, the owner went to One Planet Living and said, help us build a sustainable resort. And they said, okay, but you have to agree to our principles. He said, okay, fine, we'll do it. They said, and then here's how it works. If everybody lived like the average European you would need three planets of resources to sustain that lifestyle. If you live like the average North American, we need five planets. So the challenge is how can we build our resorts, uh, maintain our resorts, operate our resorts with only the resources of one planet? And so this resort, Villages Nature, did that and they achieved awards from the UN Environment Program and the World Hospitality Association is the most sustainable resort in the world because that's how far a gap it is from everybody else in achieving that method of operation. So with our 12 um, strategies and their framework, I wanna just take a few minutes to give you some examples of how this is being operationalized around the world in different settings. Now, these examples may or may not be the right ones for New Smyrna. I'm not trying to sell them as your examples. I'm trying to present them to give you an opportunity to think a little out of the box. Can we do that here or can we do something better or something different to help you start thinking of your own vision? The first one is um, health and happiness. Can I get everybody to stand up just for a minute? Um, I want you to, to think just really quickly how your day has been and rate it on a scale of zero to 10 of how happy you have been, okay? Everybody got your number? Now, anybody that is uh, less than five, please sit down. Anybody over five? Okay, how about uh, less than six? You? Seven? Eight? Okay. So people still standing, look around at these, these poor souls that don't have the nine or 10 levels that you do, and uh, go over to them and give them a kind word or a hug or tell them it's gonna be okay, all right? So, but um, happiness is so important in tourism because it, it really gives us an opportunity every day to make somebody's uh, day a little better. I love the mission at Disney to create happiness. They started out to, to make people happy, and they realized you really can never make people happy, but you can create opportunities for happiness. And all of us in the tourism industry have that opportunity every day. I love the idea that beach therapy should be covered by our health insurance. <laughs> and there's actually a, an international movement to quantify that, uh, and uh, these are some of the indicators that they've come up with in terms of what would really constitute happiness in terms of community standards. 
these might be things you want to think how well you're doing in New Smyrna in that regard. And equity in local economy, it happens most places in the world, the most polluted parts of a city or community are often those of the poorest people. So how do we bring that equity and economy to do things? Uh, Chad mentioned the, the cultural heritage. How do we have that cultural re resi resilience? How do we honor and create the culture that's going to move us forward into the future? Land use and wildlife. I was trapped just about this time a year ago with a hurricane. I was in Chile speaking at the Global Sustainable Tourism Conference, and I couldn't get to Florida. While well, everybody else here is trying to get out, I'm trying to get back in. And finally, the Orlando airport opened. It opened before Miami and before Tampa. And when I flew over it, I could see why. They have so many wetland areas that have soaked up the rain and, and stopped that flooding, where the Tampa, Miami areas have been really paved with concrete so much that they don't have that ability. It was really an eye-opener from the air, literally, to see how much you can do with good land use and um, wildlife. Uh, in Anna Marie Island, another, the other of the two cities in this project, they ripped out their sidewalks and did, put in permeable walkways. And do you realize that with good landscaping and these kind of walkways, when you have the kind of floods that we're seeing in North Carolina, that 50% of that can be absorbed more than if you don't have that? Think if you could reduce that flooding 50% just how you do your landscaping and your walkways, what difference that would be making in North Carolina? And what difference it might make for you if you have to face a similar crisis down the road? Sustainable water, uh, local sustainable food. I love what the third wave here is doing. It's one of my uh, favorite places. I think I could be here four times this last year. And it's, I just can't uh, wait till I get to come back every time. It's so, so fun for doing that. And looking at what our visions for the future can be, uh, Joe's going to talk about that, so I'm going to skip over that area. We have a lot of options for renewable energy, solar, water, hydro, uh, water with ocean tidal, wind, biomass, geothermal. All of these are opportunities for energy to get away from fossil fuels that are creating our adverse climate impacts. And we are part of the United uh, Nations World Tourism Organization, International Sustainable Tourism uh, Group in Madrid, Spain. And every year we take best practices, we did this last year, and we actually featured New Smyrna in the presentation. And so it's free international market. And so if you want to write up a, a great best practice like the Marine Discovery Center, which I've got to get Chad to do this year for next year's report, um, it's an opportunity that we can share that with people around the world. So uh, I'll turn it over to Joe now, and he'll give you some good tips for the future. Thank you, David. Now, so I'm the futurist, so you'll notice I'm using the high-tech stuff. It's, it's called paper. You just prepare that. There's actually a reason for that, and that is I'm going to talk about something different. I'm going to take a, a slightly different point of view. You've heard a ton of really interesting examples of where people are doing things to be more sustainable. You've heard about the things you're doing here that are incredible, that are really leading the way. You've heard about some of the data and how important tourism is. But the real purpose of this whole session is to talk about how do we make sure that New Smyrna Beach has a sustainable future, a future that takes the tourism and what it does for you now and makes it even better in the future and helps also make your community better. And it turns out that the key to that is not in high technology. The key to that comes in something that really is truly one of the oldest tools around, and that's a story. And that's what I'm going to try to do, is talk to you a little bit about how you create your story for New Smyrna Beach to achieve some of these goals that we've been talking about. But before that, I want to try and really convince you that stories are incredibly important. So I'm going to start out by telling you one, in part because that's what I love to do. This particular story takes place back in the 1950s. 
And at that time, there was another person who was trying to create the future, a, a young man by the name of Walt Disney. He wasn't here in Florida back then, he was still in California. He had this wild idea. He was going to create the future of the theme park, change the world of entertainment. And everybody said, Walt, well, you're crazy. And Roy said, quit spending money. But he said he was going to try and do that. And he realized that part of what he had to do was to inspire people to really want this new future that he was creating. So he came up with this idea. He was going to use this brand new medium. It was called television. And while he was building his theme park, he was actually telling people stories about the stories that were going to be in the theme park. Now, there are maybe one or two of you here who are old enough to remember some of those early days of the Disneyland television show. But I'm going to tell you on one particular episode. It was in the spring of 1955. It was on a Wednesday evening. 40 million people, that was a third of the entire population of this country, rushed to get to their television sets because they knew Walt was about to be on one of his episodes of something called Tomorrowland. And on that evening, he told the story of called Man in Space. And it was this incredible idea, 1955 again, right? We had not yet launched any rockets. The idea that we could not only launch rockets into space, but we might actually one day send a person to the moon. And he did it in traditional Disney style. Great cartoons, lots of humor, interspersed with lectures from Warner Von Braun, which was an interesting form of television. The next morning, the studio got a phone call from the President of the United States. Hey, Walt, saw that show last night. You need to get a copy of it. There's some generals I've got here. They need to see that story. So they wrapped up the film. They sent it off to them, and all the generals in the Air Force got to see it. Two years later, NASA was established. Eighteen years later, the first man walked on the moon. He was an American. You remember that part, right? Now, I'm a young guy, so I kind of missed that 1955 thing. But I remember in 1968, sitting glued to the television as I watched that grainy image of that first person on the moon, about 10 years ago, it was the first time I saw the show Man in Space. And you know what really blew me away? Was how eerily similar the story that Walt had imagined to what really happened. It's really simple. If you want to create this great future that everybody's talking about, that is possible, that you have the potential for, you're going to need a really compelling story. There are two reasons. The first one is change is hard. We all know that. We get it. Just quit using those straws. It's hard enough, right? Magnify that by a hundred, a thousand times when you start thinking about what it really takes to really imagine what a different future might be for this community. It is truly hard work. So you're going to need a story that this community can gather around and then work forward in the future. Now I know, storytelling and tourism in Florida, they go way back, right? We've had some great stories over the years. Ever since Flagler brought the first railroad down here, there's always been a story about how Florida was the next paradise. I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. The stories that these folks are telling are great, but you have an awful lot of competition. A couple of years ago, I was in North Dakota talking to their annual tourism conference. I didn't even know pet tours in North Dakota, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, they had a great conference, they had all these people, everybody had all the same things that everybody else has. They have great amenities, they have great accommodations, they have great weather, at least in July, in North Dakota. <laughs> and everybody's selling the same thing. So as that competition increases, and as the pressure on our environment increases over the next 10 or so years, you're really going to have to double down. And what's going to make New Smyrna Beach truly unique? Why does 2030 matter? It matters because that's when the United Nations has set up some goals in terms of this, what we call sustainable development. It matters because a lot of people feel like it's one of some of the pressures that we're dealing with are really going to come together. So I want to talk for just a second about how is it that you create that story? What do you need to craft it? There are three things. The first thing are your values as a community. New Smyrna Beach has been around a long time. You have a pretty good reputation as who you are, and you have a pretty good set of values that I think most people already know. Those don't change just because the future comes along. So keep those first and foremost. The second one is all that information about the one planet living process and all of the other ideas that you can actually use to create a more sustainable future. But the third piece, the critical piece, is you need to know who are the characters that are going to be in your story in the future. And that's what I'm really interested in. Who's going to inhabit that sustainable tourism experience in 2030 here in New Smyrna Beach? It all starts there. And I want to introduce you to three groups that I think are going to be incredibly, incredibly important for you in the future. The first one are the boomers. If you don't already think there are too many of us, well, guess what? They're going to be even more by 2030. 
By 2030, Florida will have the largest population percentage-wise of people over the age of 65 in the entire United States, something close to 25%. I know, you thought there were really more of us than that. But the truth is, we're really gonna have to start to think about how they're going to be driving the things we do in our communities and what we need for them. Now, many of these boomers are gonna be people who've been living here for years, like me. You know? Others of them are still gonna be people who think of Florida as the place they wanna to come to and they want to retire in. So we're gonna still have that happening in the next 10 to 12 years. But there are gonna be some interesting changes. One of the most challenging ones is all of that wonderful coastal property that they've been buying up over the years is not going to be quite as attractive to them. In 2017, for the first time in decades, Realtor surveys began to realize that coastal property prices were not increasing at the rate that they had in the past. And we all know why. The insurance prices were getting too high, people were hearing about the risk of living on the coast, the hurricanes were lasting too long. That's going to continue. So where are they gonna live? Well, they're gonna be my neighbors in Orlando, right? You're gonna see more and more of the large urban areas are gonna be full of, of the seniors. But they're still gonna want a day at the beach, right? And so for you guys, what's important is, is how do you answer the question, which beach are they going to go to? So let me paint a little picture for you for a moment. It's 12 years from now, and I want to go to the beach for the day, and I'm in Orlando, and I can hop on that fast train, and I can zip down to Fort Lauderdale, and it's an easy treat, and they, it's just trip, and they've got a pretty good beach down there. Or I can go on the I-4 Hell Ride. Which one do you think I'm going to take? Part of your future is clearly going to be related to how you help this region become more advanced in terms of transportation. Because transportation is going to be one of the number one keys to creating a sustainable future for Central Florida. So how are you going to encourage your friends in Orlando and in Jacksonville and the other large areas to actually begin to think about creating revenue avenues that will work to get people here? That transportation accessibility is going to be true for those seniors once they show up in New Smyrna Beach. You know, whether it's smart trolleys or autonomous car sharing or any other service that you can think of, you need to be working today toward creating a, an infrastructure for transit that doesn't rely on individual cars. Because old people don't like to drive quite as much as they used to. And that's going to be true for people of all ages in the future. So it's really important that you think about, number one, they're going to want transportation. The second thing is accessibility, and we know this, right? We're already starting to deal with this. As we get older, it gets more difficult to do the things that we always imagined we could do forever. And we think of accessibility largely in terms of improvements in lodging. And in hotels and places like that, we started to see that. But that's not the real key if you want to be the sustainable tourism destination. It's really about accessibility to your urban area. Do you have walkable neighborhoods? Do, is it easy for me to get to dinner and back to wherever it is I'm staying? Is it easy for me to get to the attractions and get back to wherever it is I'm staying? St. Petersburg is a great example if you're looking for one. They're one of the most leaders in creating a walkable city. They're doing it because they have a huge population of elders. But you know what's happening while they're doing it? They're creating a better environment for people of all ages, both tourists and local people. So accessibility is going to be a really important part of that. So the question for the boomers is, how are you gonna start creating a world for them so that they can actually get to where they wanna go, want to come here, and make sure that New Smyrna Beach continues to be their primary beach destination? Second group I wanna talk about, young professionals. The 20 and 30 year olds, who by the way in 2030 will not be millennials. They will be the generation after millennials. I know, that really is scary, isn't it? Well, the good news is we can quit complaining about the millennials. We'll have something new to complain about. They're going to be mostly single. If the economy holds up, they are going to travel more than other generations because they've grown up traveling, and traveling is part of what they're going to do, and they're going to travel in groups. They're going to be the true digital natives that we've been talking about for a long time. Some of them are only even going to be digital nomads. Now, what does that mean? One of the things we're really seeing, and this is a, you've read about it, but it's a real trend, it's really happening, is the shift in the economy away from the sort of get a job, work for 40 years, have a career, retire. That's already gone. Now it's go from job to job. In the next decade, it will go from task to task. It's what they call the gig economy. And in the gig economy, for those people who are able to negotiate it, they will become solo entrepreneurs. They will pick their jobs, and they will pick them based not only on how much money they make, and whether or not they're interested in it, 
but does it give them the opportunity to go live in places that they've never lived before? Because this new generation is really interested in that kind of experience. There are already companies out there that are in the business of actually moving digital nomads around the world, right? They buy a, a house somewhere in some foreign country, they set it up with the latest high-speed internet, and these digital nomads come in and they work there for four to six months, and then they move on to the next place. So it's like a constant kind of travel for these people. And that's gonna be one of the major movements in terms of the high-end tourism in the future. So that's what you're gonna be dealing with in terms of what you're, what you're gonna have to provide services for. What are they going to be worrying for? Number one is focus on access, not ownership. They are not interested in owning houses. They are not interested in owning automobiles. But let me tell you something. If they want dinner, they want it now. They want somebody to deliver it to them. So they're really going to be looking for an area where things come to them, right? Many of them may not even have a driver's license when it comes to transportation. So they're not going to be interested in any location that doesn't provide them with ease, ability, to access to get where they want to, or even have things come to them. They're going to be very interested in green walkable downtowns because this is going to be the environmental generation. They are seeing the effects of what's going on in the world today in terms of the degradation of our environment. They are the ones being impacted about it, and they are the ones that are going to vote with their money more than any other generation has ever done that. The next thing is, is these people are actively in the business of collecting experience badges. Now, a lot of people say that what the future of tourism is, is about creating authenticity. Authenticity is going to a McDonald's in any city, anywhere on the planet. That is not what they're looking for. They're looking for selfie-worthy experiences. It's not about having the experience, it's about documenting the experience. They're already in existence. It's like mainly, I think, is in California, which you would expect, right? These pop-up museums that are nothing more than backgrounds, right? And people walk in and go, oh, I got my picture, click, that's me and whatever, some castle somewhere. I didn't even have to go to Ireland. And they are incredibly popular. So they are going to continue to be looking for that experience that is unique, that is exotic, that's brag worthy. Maybe it's posing with a horseshoe crab because you can't do that in many other places. You know, what can you do here that you can't do anywhere else? And how can you curate those experiences for them so that they actually will work? Of course, they're going to be connected. There's a lot of talk about how the fact we're going to have this, you know, blowback and everybody's going to decide that we don't want to be connected, we're going to go to vacation and be disconnected and all of that. It's not happening, folks. Particularly not for these digital nomads. Because they're not really just going to be on vacation. They're probably going to be working and on vacation and living life where they're here. So they're going to be looking for those communities that provide them with the best, fastest broadband internet service anywhere, anytime, without any interruptions. Anybody here ever been to Chattanooga, Tennessee? I grew up in Tennessee, and not in Chattanooga, but we used to drive through it. And back when I was in the 60s, when we would drive through Chattanooga, Tennessee, if it was in the wintertime, you could not see anything, because it was an iron smelting town. It was, the pollution was horrible in that town. You couldn't breathe. It was considered one of the biggest dumps in the entire state. Well, the iron smelting business went away, and they needed to come up with a new business recently. You know what they thought about? Let's be an art and tourism destination, because that seems sexy. They've got a new mayor who's put in broadband free internet for the entire downtown area. And I just noticed this morning, I was reading the New York Times list of 52 places to visit in, in 2018. Chattanooga, Tennessee made the list. So that kind of infrastructure is going to make or break it if you want to be a leading tourism destination in the future. You need to make sure that you can provide that for them. And of course, these kids, their 20s and 30s, I could call them that, they're going to want flexible accommodations. Their parents are the ones who came up with the idea of couch surfing. You know, their parents and their grandparents are the ones who embraced Airbnb. Imagine what we'll have by 2030. I'm not even really sure, right? Bring your house with you and stay wherever you want to. But you really need to be a place that's innovative and thinking about how do we experiment with new ways to provide flexible accommodations, accommodations that can be short-term, long-term, come back to, maybe not come back to, lots of different possibilities that you're going to need to investigate. They will not, unfortunately, probably be the people mainly staying in your hotels. But the good news is the boomers will do that, so that will all work out. The next thing that's really important about this group is they expect to be engaged. They do not consider themselves tourists. They consider themselves citizens of the world, right? Globe travelers. 
And wherever they go, they expect to interact with you and be part of your community activities. And you already have some really great community centers and activities going on here. But they need to make sure that they're open to people who've never been here before, easy for people to find them, and actively creating opportunities for them to participate with you. Now, for the most part, they'll take care of that for you, right? They use things like Meetup and all sorts of other apps already to create their own groups. And that's what they'll do. They'll come here and they'll create their own experiences. You have to give them the venues. You have to give them the places that they can actually do that and have fun while they're doing it. Third group of characters, families. This, of course, is what New Smyrna Beach is known for. You've created pretty much an amazing reputation as being a family-friendly destination. You're sort of the place near the noise, right? You're not quite big on the beach, but if you want to go there, you can on a Friday night. And that's worked really well for you. And families are still going to be looking for those special places that are designed for them in the future. What's important for you to understand, though, is what those families may look like in a decade and how it may affect how they come here and what they're trying to do when they actually travel. So what will be different about the families in the future? This may surprise you, but one of the main things that's going to have an impact on vacations in the future is the fact that education is going to become dispersed. Education is going to change radically in the next decade, more than any of us imagined. So that we're going, not going to think about having to go to school nine months out of the year, five days out of every week, the way that so many of us have done it for so long. Now some of you are thinking, yeah, he's a futurist, he gets to say those crazy things. But let me give you some backup for that. Everybody has one of these, right? My guess is most of you have a smartphone version of one of these. You know how old this is? It's a lady in the back of the I don't know one of those things. They're terrible. I don't like them. Good for you. <laughs> the rest of us were addicted. Ten years old, ten years ago, the smartphone, for all practical purposes, did not exist. I talked to a lot of education groups. Ten years ago, eight years ago, if you talked to a teacher, particularly a teacher of a middle school or a high school, about these devices, you know what they told you? They are the tool of the devil. They're the worst thing that ever existed. They are destroying our younger generations and they're killing education. Five years ago, if you talk to those same teachers and you talk to them about this device, you know what they said? They're not bad. They actually open up a world of the knowledge for kids and we're starting to teach them how to use them in a good way as opposed to in a bad way. And when we go someplace, we get way more information than we ever did before. Today, they're better than having an A in my classroom. And I've had teachers say that to me. They're more important to me than having a physical A. Ten years from now, they very likely will have taken the teacher's job for all sorts of reasons. And this, none of this is a dish on teachers, right? There are other things that are going on. The point is we are distributing education. You guys have heard of the Khan Academy? Anybody can go online today, take any class for free, uh, and, the, and the quality of the education is as good as you would get in at least 80% of the schools in this country. There's something called Udemy, which means anybody who wants to can create a class on any topic they want to, and teach it to anybody for any amount of money. Harvard, MIT, Yale are now recording and giving away their college level lectures for free. What keeps people in the seats in the classrooms? Rules, regulations, and certifications. And those are going to start to break down. So what does that mean for you guys? Well, one, don't, don't despair. I think that's really a good thing. I think we have a lot of great education, a lot of diversity. But one of the things it may actually do is it may be the end of the summer vacation which in some ways could be good, particularly if you didn't have the summer vacation here in Florida. But what it does mean is it may actually change what happens when people do choose to come here. Because when they vacation, those kids are now like those 20 and 30 year olds. They're on vacation, but they're also taking a class somewhere. Or they're looking for an educational opportunity. Wouldn't it be incredible to come to New Smyrna Beach for two weeks and go to the Marine Discovery Center and get a certification in um, marine biology? How about that? Yeah. In, in understanding how to create some kind of pollution pro program that you can take home and actually use. That's the kind of education that's going to blossom. That's what's going to drive a lot of tourism destinations. Once again, I think crazy stuff because I'm the futurist, but I want you guys to understand that all of this is grounded in stuff that has happened in the past. Let me give you another example that's local. And some of you may know about it. Are any of you familiar with the Full Sail University? <laughs> I've been in Orlando for a long time. I know those boys. I remember when it was a recording studio and they needed something to do at night, so they decided to start teaching classes. 
and then later became the Full Sail Record Recording Academy, and then it later became the School of, was it Full Sail School of the Recording Arts. Now it's a full-blown university. I don't see any reason that someday Chad's gonna be the dean of the Marine Discovery Center, the University of Marine Biology. You guys can do that if you choose. You have that kind of capability, and you're gonna have an audience in a few years that's gonna be hungry for that sort of stuff, so you're gonna be looking for that kind of thing. Those are three of the main characters that I think you need to think about. You need to start creating stories for them, but there is, of course, a fourth character that's really important, and that is technology, some of the technology that Dave referred to, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the details here. I just wanna say this, for too many years, those of us who consider ourselves environmentalists have not quite had the right story when it came to technology. We've sort of said it's either the planet or it's technology. The two are in some sort of conflict. And that's just not true. The reality is we will not be able to create a sustainable planet unless we use all of this incredible technology that is out there. So as you start to think about the characters in your story in this Smart of Age, think about those three different family groups. And then also think about how technology actually plays into it and what it can actually do. The next part of your story is your values. That's the theme. That's what you want to hang the whole story on, right? And like I said, my guess is those aren't going to change radically in the next 10 years here. But I want you to think about thinking about maybe turning it just a little bit different. We talk a lot about not doing as much damage, doing as least harm as we possibly can. I think the theme for the future, our value for the future should be, let's do as much good as we possibly can for the planet. I have a friend, his name is John Robbins, he's a professor at the University of British Columbia, and he's an environmentalist, he runs an environmental program out there. They gave him an opportunity a few years ago to build a green building. And they said, go build this building, prove to us that all this stuff you're talking about is so cool. And John said, I'm not gonna just do the least amount of harm, I'm going to do the most good. And he built a building that the wastewater that comes out of that building is cleaner than the rainwater that goes in, that the heat that he provides is, he creates more heat and more electricity than he actually consumes, so that he is benefiting the planet while he benefits himself. I would suggest that's a theme that you really need to keep in mind in terms of thinking about that. Maybe this part of beach becomes the place where you can go vacation and do good for yourself and the planet all at the same time. A couple of final thoughts. I give talks like this a lot to lots of different groups. Um, and it's a lot of fun. I enjoy sharing this kind of stuff. But I always feel like when it's over, people talk about it for a day or two. I leave, I go on to my next thing, you know, and we all go, it's kind of exciting when we do that. I'm not gonna let you guys off the hook tonight. I'm actually gonna give you some action items and I know that Debbie's gonna follow up and make you do this. This is what I want you to do. First thing I want you to do is I want you to go to your favorite spot here in this Myrtle Beach. Maybe it's down in the lagoon at sunset. You know, that's one of my favorite places over here. Maybe a kayak, you know, watching the, the, the manatees, the dolphins play. Maybe it's walking down along the beach on the south side of, you know, over close to Kennedy Space Center where it's incredibly deserted sometimes if you're there early in the morning. Maybe it's in the middle of Canal Street during the Christmas celebration. I don't care where it is. Maybe it's your business. You know, maybe it's your backyard. I want you to go there, and I want you to take 10 minutes, and I want you to absorb everything about that place that makes you happy, everything about that place that makes you say, this is why I live here in this part of Beach. Then, I want you to use your imagination, and I want you to think about what that could look like in 10 or 12 years that would make it even better than it is today. What do you want it, what do you want to protect? What do you want to enhance? What do you want to change for that one spot? Not all of this one of each, but just that one spot. And the next thing I want you to do is I want you guys to start having conversations about that. Come together in groups. Share those little stories. Those are the germs of the stories. Talk about what it is that you're excited about. Talk about what it is in your wildest imagination you could think might happen. Then I want you to take it one step further. Then I want you to sit down as groups, as a community, and I want you to start creating your own stories about the future of New Smyrna Beach. And you create those stories by starting with some characters from that list that I gave you. Maybe the character is little Anna, maybe she's out on the lagoon in 2030 and she's actually finishing up her marine biology certificate with her dad while they're cruising across in their solar-powered kayak. 
Maybe it's the story of four young women, I don't know, Allison, Kayla, and Carly, who come here from Boston to live for three months while they code some sort of, you know, incredibly social progressive program for the United Nations. And they're living here, but they're at the local farmer's market buying food for the meetup for all the people who live around them, visitors and locals alike, because it's Friday night and that's what we do in New Smyrna Beach. Maybe it's the story of Jack and Celeste, a couple of retired folks who are 72 years old, who every year take their sailboat and they go all the way around Florida. And they stay at their favorite places for, oh, I don't know, three, four weeks. And you know what their favorite one is? It's the marina here at New Smyrna Beach. I'm serious. That's how you create your future. You begin to create those kinds of stories and you tell them to each other. And then you do what Walt Disney did. You use modern media. You use that new invention, social media. You tweet. You write stories on LinkedIn. You use Facebook videos and who knows what in the next five or six years. And you invite everyone to start to share and create their stories of the future. And I have a prediction for you. If you do that, when 2030 gets here, somebody will be standing up talking about how they were doing research on the past in New Smyrna Beach. And amazingly, they came across in some dusty website somewhere these stories that these group of people that lived here back in 2018 and 2019 came up. And you know what was really amazing? They turned out to be eerily true and representative of what the future of New Smyrna Beach as the leading sustainable tourism destination in the world turned out to be. I hope you can do that. Good luck. And Philip, I think you want to do a little housekeeping, but I just want everyone to leave tonight and know that tourism touches you. And I know all of you uh, panelists here have such an impact, and we look forward to working with all of you in the future. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, I've got a question here for uh, Nancy Maddox. Are you? Uh, in the house here. Go ahead and make your way up. Make your way up towards the front. I'll go ahead and ask another question as you come on up. Uh, first question here for uh, Debbie. Uh, so I, I, I've heard about this, but this must have been before my time, before I came here. Uh, so as I understand it, there used to be some billboards around town that referred to New Smyrna Beach as uh, Boat of Orlando's best beach. I guess the you know kind of implication being that it was treating New Smyrna like an exurb of, of, of Orlando there. So uh, the question is: Is Debbie the person we have to thank for ending? The short-lived <laughs> campaign, uh, New Smyrna has Orlando Beach Day, is that right? Yes, we do not really market this area as Orlando's best beach. Um, the drive market is important because there's international travelers that come into Orlando. But as we know, there's a lot of Orlandoans that have second homes here, so they do come over for the weekend. Um, we are the sweet spot between Daytona and Brevard County. These beaches are amazing, so we honestly can't stop people from coming, but we don't mass market, as I mentioned before. So we did take down those billboards. Okay, next question for Nancy. Uh, Nancy, going back to your survey uh, that you showed us, uh, we're referring to the Park and Recreation and CCR, uh, that you kicked things off with. Uh, if the survey shows a lack of knowledge of programs in the city. Uh, what are you doing to correct this? I'm working with this gentleman right here, our new public information officer, and we're um, really stepped up on the Facebook and we're just trying to get more information out there. Um, and we need your help too by getting the word out because we can't do it just us. It's, it's word of mouth that, that gets out faster than anything. So we appreciate you being part of this um, because you help us get the word out on all our programs. When, when I told everyone we did yoga and um, line dancing and things like that, people were like, I never knew that. And so um, a lot of people went back and, and told their friends, and, and our classes have actually increased just in the last month. So things like, things like that, and just need to communicate more and talk more and get things out on social media, and that, that's the way we're going to do it. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, uh, just moving right on down the line here. Next uh, couple of questions are going to be for Olivera. 
Okay, uh, so uh, it, you know the, the, the scurrilous accusation has been made that uh, that we throw softballs up here uh, at the CCR during the question and answer sessions. So, uh, as your new public information officer, I will not have any of that going forward. Uh, so, Roberto, I've got a couple questions for you regarding the advertising campaign here. Uh, first up, why does our advertisement have so little diversity? And I, I'm assuming this is in regards to racial diversity or diversity activity. Is that? Is that right? So, well, just assuming racial diversity, is that informed by uh, demographics or uh, data or some kind of trend? Actually, no, it, it, it does have a diversity. It just happens to be the cities that are the ones that uh, you know, don't show necessarily that diversity. Small sample size. Right. It's uh, two of the presentations that we brought in. Uh, but if you go through our uh, collection of images and uh, uh, you know the work that we do, as a matter of fact, as we continue to move forward, uh, we continue to capture more uh, images of the destination. Uh, and, and please keep in mind, as Debbie said, our work is not seen here, right? So, uh, you know, all our advertising is seen outside of this market, uh, you know, in, in the markets that Debbie showed before. So that's where you get to see all of that, all of that diversity. And uh, second question, uh, as uh, many of you out here probably know, we celebrated the city's 250th anniversary uh, this year. And this question asks, uh, absent is the inclusion of our city's 250th year uh, history in our market. Uh, is there anything we can do uh, in that regard? I'll take that one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> front and center on our website, visit NSVFL was the 250th information, and we also um, broadcasted this over in the United uh, Kingdom, and we actually had travel journalists come over and tour a lot of the historic sites here. So we did do a lot of marketing for 250th um, anniversary. We did on social media as well. And as Roberto said, a lot of our marketing goes out to those theater markets that are predominantly east of the Mississippi. So sometimes you don't see that messaging, but we did have that out there quite a bit. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on down the line now to Chad. Chad Trucksall here, director of the Marine Discovery Center once again. Chad, is anyone catching lionfish for local resale? Uh, I know you mentioned that lionfish event that you've got coming up here uh, this month. Is there any special license to catch or serve it in a restaurant? Uh, yeah, there are local uh, folks that, that uh, restaurants that are uh, catching it. Um, in the way that the, the, the restaurants themselves um, cannot just go out the, you know, as, a, as a restaurant owner and catch your own line fish and sell it. Obviously, there's going to be uh, all kinds of health regulations and so forth. So they have, someone has to process that, and then that processed fish then has to get sold to the restaurant, and then there's a retail version of it. So we do have local restaurants that are selling it. Um, I'm not sure who's carrying it right now at the moment, um, but if you come to Thursday night's lecture, you will find out. <laughs> okay, Chad, another question for you. Uh, what percentage of the Marine Discovery Center's revenues are uh, related to visitors as opposed to uh, I guess domestic uh, inducement of each residence? Yeah, th that's a good question. Um, so MDC operates uh, with an annual budget of about, we're at around $620,000 at this point. And a lot of that budget, um, uh, well, I should say about 55% of it is fee-for-service programming. So boat tours, kayak tours, um, camp programs, field trips. Um, and all of that extra revenue that we generate from any of those programs, that then goes to uh, help support the non-revenue generating programs that we offer, which is the other half uh, of some of the things that I talked about. Um, as far as with, out of that revenue generation, how much of it is tourist, I would have to say uh, we're probably, probably at about 20 to 25% of our operating budget comes from the tourist uh, that is in Spring. Okay, and a uh, final question here. Uh, what is the Indian River Waterway classification? And with the current mayoral race, what is the impact of the changes to the reclassification that they want? And I'm assuming this refers to class one, class two, class three water quality? No. Yeah, yeah, so there's a, currently the, marine, the, the Indian River Lagoon is under a wrap, which is up for final approval. A wrap is a reasonable assurance uh, plan is. So it's the Mosquito Lagoon Reasonable Assurance Plan. Um, basically, our waters uh, were recently tested and have been deemed as impaired. 
And so, um, but the good thing is, is our county and stakeholders, and Newsmart Beach being one of them, got ahead of it to create this reasonable assurance plan. Um, so, overall, we're not very happy with water quality, uh, whether it's um, uh, brown tides and uh, cyanobacteria, we've had some issues. This year, luckily, uh, we've had a lot of tannic acid, but we had uh, so a lot of stained water, but not a lot of algal bloom. So if you go further south, south end of the Mosquito Lagoon, and into Brevard County, it's different. Uh, they're absolutely experiencing brown tides. So um, I'm not sure what class we're actually particularly in at, at this point, um, but we are considered an impaired water body, and we absolutely need to um, uh, improve that. There's going to be a meeting in October. I don't recall exactly when it is when you can uh, um, decide for yourself where you, whether you want the standards that are being recommended to move forward uh, as regards to the reasonable assurance plan. At the Marine Discovery Center, we're not, we think it's a good effort, but we feel like we don't want to lower the current standards that are set right now. There is some recommendation at this point in time to actually lower those standards. And we're looking at it like, how can you lower the standards when the water looks the way that it has in the last several years? That's October 19th, 10 a.m. at the library. October 19th, 10 a.m. at the library. Thank you, Steve. And I guess just uh, for those here in the audience who may not know, can we clarify what exactly is uh, the difference between class one water and class two water? As I understand it, class one water is, is, you know, lower is better. So class one is good enough to drink, class two safe enough to, to bathe in, for example. Is that, do I have that right? Yeah, that, that's correct. It's based on uh, fecal coliform and, and the, the overall health of the water, the water body itself, whether you can actually eat out of the water, whether you can swim in the water. Uh, there has recently been a report card that uh, some of you may have attended a session with the Marine Resources Council. We hosted that Marine Discovery Center, and we talked about uh, you know where we are with classification. But truthfully, I'm not exactly sure where we are. It, it is it depends on where you are in the lagoon water body itself right. and how the close proximity you are to um, pond sediment and the flushing that occurs. Yeah. Uh, well, there was a uh, going way back now to our uh, environmental CCR. There was a recommendation that came directly from uh, audience uh, participation uh, relating to uh, the feasibility of uh, having businesses discharging into the uh, Indian River Lagoon, uh, kind of upgrade to class two level discharge. So, so that uh, so you know these kind of questions are already floating around in the, the CCR uh, kind of uh, ecosphere. Okay. Uh, uh, Come up with the next question here for, and I guess, uh, Chad, since you kind of touched on this, we can maybe split this one up with, uh, with Joe here. Uh, how can we build on the long history of New Smyrna Beach to attract tourism? If, for example, are there any plans to create walking tours? Again, something that came up during the cultural resources portion of the February CCR, uh, which is, hey, how can we draw more attention to our, our, our history and our cultural site? So Debbie, uh, as well, if uh, any of you want to get in on this one. Have to hear your response. We actually are installing a trip planner on our website. Um, we are actually working more to do um, market the area of the fitness uh, place. And we've got that beautiful boardwalk out at Smyrna Dunes Park. We've got you know 17 miles of beautiful beaches. We've got the beautiful trails that Volusia County's been putting in. So we definitely market that. We have it on the mobile app as well. So you're going to find that a lot more of our um, collateral moving forward. And again, it'll, it'll hit the outside markets more than what you'll probably see here, but we definitely want to advocate for that. And I think that's something that's very important for the generations to come. Yeah, I'll just add, we, we, uh, we do a lot of programming. Uh, we work with the city on, uh, on some of their uh, programs. Like we do a walk in the rack program uh, on the beach. Um, and um, it's in conjunction with a lot of other programming as well. Um, we've done bike tours over at uh, Sapphire where we take a stroll and we, and we, uh, we go through the, um, the preserve area, the Indian River Lagoon Preserve Park, and just kind of showcase some of the unique habitats, the canopies, the uh, black needle rush, some of the salt marsh and mangrove habitats. Uh, we do a lot of uh, programming from our boat where we go to a variety of these different locations. Um, Walking tours, I know ACA has been doing these great sound walk tours uh, around the community. Um, I believe they're free of charge. And it's just another way that, that again, we're walking, but we're using the idea of sound um, as, a, as, as 
how we interpret uh, our environment. So there's a lot of things out there. Um, as nonprofits, sometimes we do have a hard time getting that message out. We use social media a lot and so forth. But I do think if you start looking, um, each one of us has some really unique programming like that, but I also think there's a lot more opportunity to expand. And uh, Roberto, any thoughts on this? How well does kind of cultural heritage play uh, when it comes to advertising campaigns? Do you, do you, do you, you know, do, are dividends paid from that in your experience? Yes, they do. As a matter of fact, as Joe was talking about experiences and being able to people, people to come to places and feel, you know, uh, like a local and try and understand, uh, you know, what is here. So not only from the idea of going back to a high school uh, that existed there, and now you have a marine center. Uh, you know, in our experience as uh, destination marketers, uh, we find ourselves uh, moving, not moving away, but enhancing the destination and leveraging uh, the history and the culture. So, as, a, as an example, uh, you know, Miami, one of our clients, was known for beach and sun and fun. Today, we have, uh, uh, we promote 19 neighborhoods individually uh, to try to promote and have people uh, visit those places. They'll always go to the beach, they're always going to go to South Beach and go to the club, but they will also uh, try to uh, uh, learn more about uh, you know, black history of the historic uh, Overtown or go Haiti or from a Hispanic perspective go to Little Havana. So developing those programs, those walks, those, uh, uh, those experiences, those stories that we say in marketing uh, is, uh, is, is important and sometimes culture and history are natural, which is what we have the most here. Thanks. Okay, uh, kind of moving on down the table now uh, here, talking about sustainable communities, right? Touching on that angle. Uh, <clears throat> this question, uh, fireworks seem more popular than ever. Is there a way to discourage their use? It seems like it's very bad for the environment. So I know 4th of July, right? Not about the fireworks, but, and I, and I guess Chad maybe too, you know, is, is there, any known negative impact from fireworks and wildlife and habitat here, and uh, you know, is there a way to maybe mi mitigate those? I mean, you, I mean, obviously yes, right? I mean, it's it's Fourth of July. We all love Fourth of July. It's a, it's always been. I know uh, as someone who grew up on the beaches, it's something that you really look forward to. Uh, and then as I became much more aware of you know the wildlife that uh, comes up on our beaches or that roosts in our mangrove. Islands. As I became a teenager, I really started understanding. Like, whoa, they're, they're kind of, you know, terrifying these animals. So, uh, so you sure? I mean, there we see uh, birds flush sometimes. We do go out in our rookeries and we we watch to make sure that we don't have adult birds that leave uh, the babies because it does coincide with nesting season. Um, and then we try to do our best in our beaches, but it's absolutely it's, it's absolutely a challenge. So the, the biggest thing that we've done so far is work together in, with local groups. Uh, and there's several local groups now, which is great to see, to go July 5th and actually start cleaning up the beach and prevent some of those impacts. But I don't have any solutions for you, that's for sure. <laughs> One uh, solution that kind of an interesting uh, story is Disney is known for fireworks every yeah. day, every night, right? But um, when they expanded the park at Disneyland to include California Adventure, they literally took out the parking lot and put the new theme park in, and they're then too close to the residential area of the streets, so there was no possibility of any fireworks. Um, so not to give up on doing something, they created a water laser show. It had no uh, damage, had uh, incredible uh, public reception and opportunity. So there's one alternative or something you can do, and you can do it right out on your waters here too. So just one, one idea. And I'll add one more to that. Um, and I'm sure you've probably already seen this, but what will replace fireworks probably within a decade are, are drone shows. Um, they've already actually done this. You know, you release a thousand tiny drones and the lights are programmed and they do everything you want them to do and they fly exactly where you want them to do. So from an entertainment point of view, they're 10, 15, 20 times better. Uh, they're reusable. They don't really cost as much and they don't make noise. They don't fall in the ocean. Um, across China, they become hugely popular. So that's a really big thing, I think, that will do that. So that's another example of how technology can actually benefit your sustainable goals. 
Okay, uh, we've got about 11 minutes left and we're down to only two questions. And I, I'm feeling a little conflicted about this because uh, we've ended every other CCR with, all right guys, you know, sorry we didn't get to all your questions, but we'll email you your responses, don't worry about it. We actually have world record opportunity here to do all the questions. I'll give you the opportunity though because, you know, on the other side, I do want your input. So if you have any questions out there that I did not collect, take this opportunity now during this next two questions to bring them up here to the podium and I'll make sure that they get read. Okay, um, so these next two questions deal with traffic. Uh, and, and traffic is really, uh, I mean, just from reviewing the CCRs, but has really gotten into every CCR that we've done. From environment, cultural resources, growth and development, uh, social equity, public safety, the economy, uh, parks and ranch, and that's what, like, there, there's been a comment on traffic in every single one, so. Uh, so we'll go ahead and, and hit these. And I know you said millennials uh, are turning towards not driving regular with driver's licenses, but if that's the case, it seems like our residents aren't experiencing that here. So the first question uh, is, I'm concerned that very heavy traffic, especially on State Road 44, uh, will deter and discourage tourism, uh, as well as uh, unesthetic development and too rapid growth that will change our image. Any solutions? I drove over from Warner Springs this afternoon. Um, I, I got on the list at 4.15 and there were all these cars. I was like, where did these people come from? Um, the traffic is not going to disappear immediately. Um, but, and, and it won't probably go away unless the community makes a dedicated commitment to provide alternatives. That's really the key. Uh, what is happening in the largest cities around the world where traffic has just gotten ridiculous is they're making it so costly to drive in the city that people are parking their cars. You know, economics is a great way to control this, this sort of thing. Um, if you can figure out a way to provide an alternative, the economics of it increasingly, I think, are in your favor. Um, the other thing is, and nobody really has completely figured this out, but there is a possibility that we will get autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, Uber's looking at creating a whole fleet of them that will be much more efficient. And one of the things that it actually does for an urban area or even a smaller town is you eliminate a lot of the parking requirements because the cars are on the road because they're going somewhere. The average car, I think, has used something like 10 or 15% of its life. The rest of the time it sits parked. If we decrease the number of cars parked, we can get rid of a lot of parking garages and parking spaces, which means we could free up more space for green spaces and other uses inside the city center. So there are different alternatives with that. Um, but the real answer is deciding you don't want cars, and you have to offer people an alternative. And if you do that, people will take it. Okay, thank you. Uh, and final question, uh, just to piggyback on traffic here. Uh, because of the increase in traffic, people have real concerns about safe driving. How can we do a better job in this area? I know everyone thinks, oh, well, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles, once they take over, it'll be, you know, footloose and fancy free. You know, I can read my paper on the way to work. But, I mean, is that, you know, that, on the other hand, we've seen incidents of, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles striking pedestrians in some cases. So, uh, so what does the future of traffic safety look like? There are a couple of technological developments that can improve some of that, and it doesn't require the cars to be completely autonomous and without any driver input. Anybody buy a car in the last year that has some sort of safe driving, self-driving thing on it? The, the seat shakes if you get too close to somebody, it actually stops. If you, that's going to continue to happen, and that will actually make driving safer because it turns out that even though some of the autonomous vehicles have had accidents, they are way safer than we are, if you look at just the numbers in terms of that. So as we continue to improve that technology, we will get things better. There are a lot of other really advanced technology in terms of embedding sensors in the highways so that you know where every car is, so that you can then communicate with those safety devices. And it gets very complicated, but you can create a network of automobiles which will increase the safety. It's costly, it takes time to do all of that. Um, but we'll see traffic accidents, my guess would be, will continue to go down, diminish over time, diminish traffic as worse. Yeah. I just wanted to 
fun to add that we just did an update to our mobile app and we're working with the city of East Myrtle Beach where we've given access to the back end of the uh, mobile app to the parking lots and we're able to shut down the parking lots or the beach access when the beach is full or the parking lots are full and then we market the app so that hopefully everyone downloads it on i4 or you know whichever ways they're coming in 95 and with signage on 44 um, hopefully we can eliminate some of the backlog on the south causeway um, when they're heading over towards the beach side so this is something that just launched before labor day so as we work through this and work with the city we're trying to get the word out so hopefully people will know before they go yeah, I just wanted to add uh, to the prior question because it was not only traffic but also just on, on, on the sprawl that we're seeing, a lot of the growth that we're seeing in our development uh, along 44. Um, again, I came out here 20 years ago from South Florida and the woods that I played in as a kid that I really fell in love with, you know, 15 years later were the sand hills. Uh, that I would see the younger kids playing on, and they thought that, that that was their baseline, right? That was like, oh, this is so awesome. Well, it was the, it was the retention ponds being dug out to create the fill dirt that would then be used for development. And then five more years later, that whole area was completely developed. So, I, you know, and, and it's the, the typical, um, one of the things that we talk a lot about um, the Community Discovery Center, especially with our Florida Master Naturals program, is like we have an opportunity in Florida to set the stage for what Florida should look like. It doesn't look like other states. People just have expectations of, so when it comes to our landscaping, and I think New Smyrna has a lot of opportunity from the residential and commercial, whether it's setbacks, making sure that we keep these large, beautiful um, oak trees, um, just making sure that we think about continuous habitat. And sure, does that potentially have a, uh, you know, an opportunity for a developer to go, oh, there's so many rules. Well, no, the city of New Smyrna Beach you know, should be open to, and I know that they are working with developers, but making sure that they're doing it in the right way, making sure that we have native plants, making sure that we don't require a fertilizer and pesticides on every yard that's put out there. So to me, that's an opportunity to set a standard without just being restrictive, but more inclusive, like look how unique, look at the special place that you're building in, and make sure that everyone who comes and lives here, they know that, understand it. So I look at it as an opportunity, not as a barrier. There's a, there's a wonderful uh, book called Reinventing Fire that has a section on transportation and there's a number of strategies that can help people um, to rethink the automobile, rethink uh, how we travel, rethink how we design communities. Um, I actually had a section in my presentation that I had unbeknownst to me half my presentation was deleted, um, and so I didn't get to share that. But the key thing for me about transportation is that what Joe referenced, we've got to, to learn to give up the automobile and uh, appreciate the gift that we're gonna get without it. Um, that may seem strange to you, but people all over the world are going to live without the automobile in an incredibly healthy way. And um, I, I was, uh, did some research last year in Cuba and was struck that they move all these people around in Havana and they only got one thirtieth per capita cars that we do in the U.S. So finding different ways with bicycles and pedestrian walkways and AVs and horse-drawn buggies and so forth are all different kinds of alternatives. And as Joe mentioned, once we start freeing up that open space, we can do that. There's also policy decisions like start uh, paying uh, by the mile we drive rather than the uh, gallons of gas that we consume. That makes a huge difference on people's choices of how often they'll drive and why they'll drive and things like this. But if you want to really want to delve into this in some real detail, pick up that uh, book or even Google the short videos, Reinventing Fire slash Transportation. Just add one more thing to that. Um, this is a generational shift. Um, how many here do you, do you have Uber here? Do you have Uber? Yeah. How many people here use Uber on, say, more than once a month? If, I, if, this, if this audience was full of people who were 20, you know, how many hands would go up? They would all go up, right? Um, 
And one of the things that does is it, it shifts your expectations. We all grew up with the expectation that I want to go someplace, I want to be in my car, I want to go where I want to go, and I don't want to wait for anybody. And, that's, and the only other option was the bus, which you had to wait for six hours more and it never showed up. Uber is changing that, and the technology behind Uber is actually being adopted by some of the people who run the mass transit systems. And there's a group in Orlando that's uh, developing uh, some software so that you can do that with the bus system. You know, I want to go someplace, I can find out that there's a bus coming in six minutes and where I need to be, I don't have to plan my whole day around it. So technology is really going to take away the, the challenge. Because the problem is we want to be able to go home and wake up. And technology is going to solve some of that and make it a little bit easier so it doesn't feel quite draconian to give up my car. And I think that will make it easier for the public to agree to this because it is something we have to do, both for the planet and just for our cities. And not, you know, I can't imagine what it's like here on a Saturday trying to. I don't come here on a Saturday, that's why I'm doing it. <laughs> okay, uh, before I ask this last question, I want to just go ahead and thank everybody for coming out. It's been a great CCR. Thanks. Uh, looks like uh, a lot of people uh, actually made it all the way through, so it's been. Fantastic. If you want to see what happens with these questions uh, after the CCR, right? these don't just go into a, a hidey hole somewhere and vanish. We, we take this information, right? we identify trends, and we build recommendations for the neighborhood council, which is a citizen-based advisory group, and the, uh, the city commission ultimately will look at these at their December strategic planning session and rank them and prioritize them and say, hey, you know, as your elected officials, what do we want to see uh, the city prioritize going forward? So, speaking of the election, on the final question here, seeking a point of clarification from Chad. A current candidate for city commission claims the oysters used in the shuck and share program uh, are harmful because they are not from here. Thoughts? Alien oysters. Yeah, we, um, so if, if everyone uh, ever has a question that you're unsure about when it comes to the Indian River Lagoon or any of our programs, please feel free to ask us directly. Um, because we want to always make sure that factual information is getting out and, and getting spread to the community. And it's just as easy to spread you know, non-factual information or incorrect information. So the eastern oyster is the oyster that's up and down the eastern seaboard. It's the same exact genus and species, so it does not change. So there may be uh, an oyster that comes from Maine or New York or even Louisiana or Texas but it's the same exact calcium carbonate genus and species genetically as the oyster that comes from our water. So what we do is we put that shell, empty shell, back into the water, and it's the best material ever. We tried all other types of materials in order for little baby oysters to recruit or attach to, but it's that oyster shell, the um, eastern oyster, that the little baby oyster will, will basically swim over and is chemically attracted to and will attach to it. And at that point, it's called spat and grows from there. So, you know, I don't know if this is a myth buster, but it is just one type of, of oyster uh, that we have here. Um, there are several types of, uh, there are several species of oyster that most people don't even realize, but the oyster that all of us are working on is the eastern oyster. And that's up and down the eastern seaboard, same exact species, only one species. I hope that answered your question. And with that, once again, I thank you. Two important dates to remember. Uh, October 16th, that's going to be the last CCR on transportation, right? And based on the input we've been seeing on traffic, it's going to be a big one, right? So any and all recommendations you've got, that's the time to bring them. Right back here, October 16th. And then finally, we'll have a big program wrap-up. We'll look at uh, where we've been, what we did, and where we're going on November 27th, again, right here at the Grand Center. Thanks again for coming, and let's have a round of applause here for our speakers and everyone else.